Our first reading today is one of my favorite readings from Isaiah. I love the imagery and the emotion in that story. When God appears to Isaiah, the prophet is distraught because he knows, perhaps better than anyone, that he is unworthy to behold God. He probably thinks he's about to die because nothing unclean, such as himself, can come into contact with God. But then, rather than commanding him to go and to wash or perform some other ritual purification, God solves the problem of Isaiah's uncleanness by sending one of the seraphs to cleanse him. Then, God proceeds to ask a very obviously rhetorical question. Who will go for us, God says. The story gives no indication that there's anyone but God and the seraphs and Isaiah in the temple. And you can almost see God asking this question and then looking at Isaiah. But to his credit, Isaiah doesn't seem to need the cue. He answers enthusiastically, here I am, send me. I can almost picture him like an excited second grader waving his hand so the teacher will see him even though he's the only one in the room. And that's when the fun starts, right? Isaiah is to be the one to carry God's message. And what is that message? Don't listen to this message. At least that's how I've always read it. God seems to be saying, don't pay any attention to what I'm trying to tell you. Don't trust your eyes. Don't believe what you hear. God then tells Isaiah to make sure that nobody understands God says, make the mind of this people dull. Shut their eyes. Plug their ears so they can't turn and be healed. If Isaiah were to do that, that would make him the world's most ineffective prophet. So why is God asking this? Why does God want this? I like to think that it is precisely that question that God wants us to ask as we hear this. Because if God didn't want anyone to listen to the message, why would God bother sending the message at all, right? If God actually wanted to avoid saving the people, God wouldn't have sent a prophet. God would not have asked, who will go for us? So maybe this message is a commentary on what the people are already doing. A call to awareness of how they're getting in their own way. By waking them up to what's going on, maybe God is hoping that they will look and listen and be healed. That's how I have typically understood this text when I come to it. I see it as God pointing out how stubborn and oblivious and resistant we can be to God's attempts to save us from the destruction that we would bring on ourselves. And honestly, that seems like a pretty timely message. But then, at our weekly Wednesday Bible study, where we sit with a bunch of different people who read this text also and see it in different ways, we hear different ways of telling this story. And this week, somebody shared how in reading these same verses, they could hear another message. They heard God saying, keep looking, even if you can't see it. Keep listening, even if you don't understand it. Maybe understanding isn't the important part. Maybe showing up is. Now, I'll admit to you, I had never considered that angle before. I don't know if I ever would have. Where I heard a clever rhetorical device to call our attention to our failings, this person heard encouragement from God to keep seeking, even when the seeking seems futile. One might be tempted to ask which of these interpretations is correct. But I think that question misses the point. Either or both of these interpretations could be very different or even contrary from what Isaiah himself intended when he wrote this down. But that's the beauty of scripture. The truth is not limited to what's on the page. Scripture is scripture because it helps us to enter into a conversation with God. Isaiah's oracles and Paul's letters 
and Luke's Jesus stories, all of it are records of the experiences of faithful people experiencing God with praise, with doubt, with thanksgiving, with terror, experiencing God obediently or defiantly or joyfully or sorrowfully, and then inviting us to experience God for ourselves in their stories. Many Christians, perhaps even some of us gathered here today, have been taught that to ask questions of the scriptures is to doubt their validity or to challenge their authority. But I wonder, what if our questions are one of the places where God can meet us in this text? Every Wednesday, as we question that text, we grow in understanding and in knowledge, but also in faith and in hope and in love. Sometimes our questions lead us to answers that are not helpful for building up ourselves or our community. But thankfully, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of tradition and doctrine to help us discern the difference. But even when those questions lead us to dead ends, I think that that work of discerning what comes from the Holy Spirit and what are the voices of our own desires or reasoning, I think that's valuable work. Work that teaches us something about who God is and what God is doing. Pastor and author Brian McLaren writes, to say that the word or the message or the meaning or the revelation of God is in the biblical text then does not mean that you can extract verses or statements from the text at will and call them God's words. It means that if we enter the text together, feel the flow of its arguments, get stuck at its points of tension, struggle in its unfolding plot and all its twists and turns, then God's revelation can happen to us. We reach the point that Job and company did at the end of that book, where after a lot of conflicted talk and conspicuously long divine silence, we finally hear God's voice." End quote. Our lessons today describe different people meeting God in surprising and unexpected ways. Isaiah has this vision of God in the temple. Peter encounters God in a wandering rabbi on a lake shore. As we come to these texts, we come explicitly looking to see God. But I wonder, what if God is not appearing in the way we've been taught to expect? What if, for all of our looking and hearing and reading, we are still not comprehending, still not listening? Paul writes today about his experience. His experience with Jesus, who appeared to him last of all as to one untimely born. Or another way of translating that, born in the wrong way. He's referring to the fact that unlike Peter and James and all the others, Paul came into the church backwards, as it were, because he had been persecuting the church. He was zealously working for God, he thought, only to find out that he'd actually been working against God the whole time. Is it possible that the church itself might find itself doing the same thing? Might we be sometimes working against God without even realizing it? We've been teaching people that God is to be found in memorizing verses and accepting doctrines and doing good works as though those things were God. Speaking for myself, those are not the places where I've found God. Sometimes those tools have helped me in my search, but where I've always encountered God has been in the relationships. In all of their complexity, difficulty, and beauty, my relationships with the broken and flawed people called into this community we call the church. 
my relationships with the characters in these stories, and even with the stories themselves, when they challenge me, and cause me to ask questions, even cause me to doubt. In the push and pull, the give and take that exists within all of these relationships, that's where God has appeared to me, in the tension, in the questioning, in the seeking. In my experience, getting too focused on the details, the literal words of scripture or the specificity of doctrines or the righteousness of our actions, those things shut down more opportunities to find God than they open. I can't help but wonder if this is the same kind of religiosity that Isaiah is lamenting when he calls himself a man of unclean lips and his people a people of unclean lips. I wonder if he perceived in that moment when he saw this vision of God in the temple that they had all along been offering their prayers and their worship to something that he could now see was not God. Because those things, those beliefs and doctrines and actions, they have never offered salvation. They can't. They force us to rely on ourselves, our right belief, our practice, our right action. It's too easy for me to fall short, to miss the mark like Paul. Jesus, on the other hand, meets me in the scriptures, in the questions, in the seeking, in the wondering thrills me with the wonderful and ecstatic possibilities of God's amazing abundance, like the catch of fish so great that it sinks the boats hauling it in. In the story, when Jesus told Peter to put out again and let the nets down, Peter politely explains that he and the other seasoned fishermen, the ones who knew what they were doing, had worked all night and caught nothing. It was now the wrong time of day to go fishing. And Jesus, not being a fisherman, has no idea where to go or what to do to catch fish. But he agrees anyway. He let go of what he knew to be correct and true. He let go of what he had already done. He opened himself to the possibility of something new at the invitation of his passenger. I wonder as I read this story, what might we as the church be invited to let go of? What doctrines or beliefs or traditions are no longer serving us well? What are we doing or not doing that is holding people back from meeting Jesus among us. And by the same token, what should we not let go of? What's the core of our message, the good news, the gospel that has been handed on to us in turn by those who received it before us? What is central to who we are as the church as baptized Christians. Perhaps asking those questions may help us to know something more about the one who has called us, even something more about ourselves. Perhaps asking those questions may help us find a reward for our searching, even as we sail out into deeper waters. It may be frightening or threatening to consider what we might be asked to leave behind. These things we're talking about, our beliefs and our doctrines and our traditions, they've served us well. To let go of them may feel like rejecting or dishonoring them. But what if instead we're, we maybe consider that we are in the position of Peter and James and John, having just hauled in this massive catch of fish? Their boats are flooded, their nets are torn. They've almost lost everything. And yet, Jesus tells them not to worry. 
the nets and the boats, these tools of the trade of being fishermen, they're no longer necessary. Because now, he says, they'll be catching people rather than fish. And that requires a different set of tools. So perhaps that's the question being asked of us today as we prepare to leave torn nets and swamped boats behind. What tools will we need for the next leg of this adventure?